Okay, so <clears throat> happy birthday, uh, Minoru Yamasaki. Uh, he was born on, on, on the 1st of December in uh, 1913 and died at uh, 73 in 1986. Let's, uh, let's read a little bit about him. This is not going to be a very long uh, presentation. Actually, maybe next year, if I do this again, um, I, I hope I will uh, develop the presentation on him. So Minoru Yamasaki, as you can see, born on December 1st, 1913, and died in February 1986, was a Japanese-American architect best known for designing the original World Trade Center in New York City and several other large-scale projects. Yamasaki was one of the most preeminent architects of the 20th century. He and fellow architect Edward Darrell Stone are generally considered to be the two master pra practitioners of new formalism. Uh, I would say a few more things. I should have had a larger uh, text, a uh, longer text here, because he had a very unusual uh, uh, professional biography. He actually struggled. He struggled because uh, first he was Japanese, and we can imagine after the Second World War to be Japanese in the United States uh, was uh, uh, not quite auspicious, so to speak. So he had to struggle and he was very poor at the beginning, understood he did all kinds of jobs. And this man who, who you know, had, uh, you know, uh, uncomfortable circumstances arrived at being commissioned with the World Trade Center and many other you know, large buildings, which shows that with the tenacity and talent and a lot of hard work, it's possible to, to transcend even uh, you know, biographical difficulties, uh, not quite, uh, not quite uh, small. Uh, but of course he was Japanese and I'm glad that in the, in the short uh, text that I read from Wikipedia, he's presented as being Japanese American, although he was born in the United States, but his parents were Japanese. Well, what I wanted to say is that the Japanese do teach us a lesson. Uh, they, they taught us, they teach us, and they will probably teach, uh, continue to teach us. It, that is the, 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 the lesson of very, very hard work and, um, you know, uh, almost a, a fanaticism of, uh, of uh, you know, being uh, extremely scrupulous and, uh, um, you know, uh, extremely de detail-oriented and, uh, so the, the, the Japanese, as you know, do have uh, virtues which cannot be ignored. And, and the fact that the Japanese have the largest number of Pritzker Prize laureates, uh, uh, you know, winners, uh, does say something. It's not an accident. Uh, and, uh, but he didn't uh, build, in, he didn't live in Japan. He lived in the United States. And it happened that he lived at the wrong time, at the wrong place. And yet, at the wrong time and in the, at, 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 at the wrong place, he was able to, to, uh, to achieve uh, remarkable things. Again, to be, to be uh, appreciated and commissioned with very large, uh, very large projects. You'll find other data about him um, on, on Wikipedia. You know, apparently he even had uh, several wives and uh, you know, uh, I think at one moment he even remarried a, a former spouse. So I guess in, in the field of domesticity, he had troubles like many others, but he remained and be became an architect about whom um, we talk today. Um, Non-critical globalism. This is a, a wording that came to me, so to speak, came to my mind while I was preparing this presentation, because his architecture is a globalist architecture. The, the so-called new formalism that Darrell Stone and himself were, uh, you know, uh, associated with 
is one aspect of, of their architecture. I think another aspect is, uh, uh, is this uh, rather non-critical globalism. I am of course referring uh, implicitly to the critical regionalism that uh, was uh, advocated by Kenneth Frampton, although he was not the only, the, the one who uh, first thought of these words. Uh, critical uh, uh, regionalism. But if we are to compare critical regionalism with non-critical globalism, what could we say? Uh, there is a lot of non-critical globalism today as well. A lot of architecture that is, uh, <clears throat> you know, uh, <clears throat> comfortably advocating the values of high capitalism, <clears throat> very commercial and uh, you know, serving uh, the power uh, <clears throat> is usually non-critical globalism. And it was so at the time when, when um, uh, Minoru Yamasaki uh, built what he built. If something turned me off when I was in the proximity of the World Trade Center of the two towers was exactly this that I felt there was a, a, a hegemony there in those towers, those two towers <clears throat> expressed through their architecture that uh, <clears throat> made, me, uh, <clears throat> made me uneasy. It was truly a, 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 an architectural accomplishment which uh, advocated the power of the strong. But I think Minoru Yamasaki, <clears throat> I don't know if this was part of the program, for that uh, building or for those two towers, but the fact that he 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 uh, created two towers, somehow he uh, there was a, a form of sabotaging that very globalism that I am trying to to depict here, you know, because if it was one, just one tower as it is now, perhaps that globalism would have been even more. Uh, stringent, even more, uh, uh, you know, uh, explicit. But with two towers, things became a little bit complicated somehow. So now when I think backwards, I am beginning to see even some positive aspects in, um, even in those two towers, which as I said, I, uh, I never entered, although I was very close to, I did enter, but only at the level of the, um, you know, the, uh, the ground level. Okay, now North Shore Congregation Israel, uh, he built a few things that, this, this puzzles me a little bit. Uh, it, it is an architecture that is, uh, well, it was described as being formalistic, <clears throat> but um, I, th I think Minoru Yamasaki, uh, although he was not European, his parents were not European, I think he liked, he liked <clears throat> uh, on one hand the Gothic, and on the other hand, maybe even uh, touches of, uh, of Islam. Uh, and, and this can be seen in, a, in, a, in the decorative aspects of his work. His work is structural, is rhythmical, you can see clearly here, but also in the curvatures he uses, I see some kind of a longing towards <clears throat> a pre-Renaissance European architecture and uh, maybe to an extent also uh, a, a, an Islamic architecture. And the combination between these actually three forces, on one hand, global capitalistic North American mentality and culture, and architecture, and on the other hand, you know, uh, a certain, uh, uh, I don't know if nostalgia, but a certain influence that came to him via, you know, the Gothic, the Middle Ages, and also perhaps um, Islam makes his architecture kind of interesting. And also, I think it is to be mentioned that he didn't reject ornament. Uh, in, in his work, it was an anticipation of what we are witnessing today, some kind of a um, uh, coming together of structure and ornament. And this can be seen very well in the works of uh, um, Zaha Hadid architects 
under the leadership of Patrick Schumacher, especially. I actually feel tempted to see some resemblances, some, relation, some possible relations between the latest phase of uh, parametricism as described by Patrick Schumacher, that is tectonism, and some of the architecture of um, uh, Minoru Yamasaki. Because pa Patrick Schumacher did say very clearly, uh, and I, I agree with him, that structure and ornament should come together and at once, simultaneously. And it happens that because of parametrices, it is possible today for structure to become ornamental and for ornament to become structural. Something of this sort seems to be also present um, uh, in, in, in some of the works by Minoru Yamasaki. It is a good work. It is good architecture, but it is a little bit, for my taste, a little bit um, official, so to speak. You know, it's but it is elegant. It is uh, if it is so-called official, it is uh, there is there is elegance here and there is refinement, and I think this refinement is is derived from the the, the implicit acceptance of ornament, it understood in a very general sense. He didn't uh, just create a rationalistic uh, structure and then, uh, you know, applied some uh, decorative elements on it. No, you, we can see here structure itself is ornamental. And uh, in this way, he anticipated uh, what uh, now, for example, uh, as I said, Patrick Schumacher and Zaha Hadid architects do. Or ornament is coming back with strength, great force these days, and it's obvious in, in, in many ways. Apparently, the world is a little bit tired of uh, the austerity and even predictability of an obsession with structure. Although here structure is very obvious, but as I said, it's an ornamental structure. It's a structure which, which is softened by uh, a concern for something that transcends it. I know I, I, I express myself paradoxically, but this seems to be the case. And uh, the benefits are, 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 are for all to see here. It's a structure which, as I said, seems to desire or to want to transcend itself through approaching itself uh, of uh, what we call uh, ornament. Uh, and I mentioned this, I think, even yesterday, that yes, we were influenced by Adolf Loos and by uh, his writings on crime and ornament or ornament and crime. We were influenced by Miss van der Rohe, but both Adolf Loos and Miss van der Rohe did use ornament and sometimes copiously uh, uh, through their choice of a marble, sometimes in large surfaces, in large quantity, which was highly ornamental. I mean, the Barcelona pavilion has uh, obvious ornamentation in some large surfaces which are covered with a very, very, very decorative uh, marble. Uh, and, uh, you know, so our myth that uh, ornament should be banished uh, is, uh, you know, weakened by, by the very practice of uh, someone like Adolf Loos or uh, Miss van der Rohe. But back to Minori, Minoru Yamasaki, uh, we see here, if we look upwards, and sorry for the, for the picture, which is, uh, you know, low resolution, uh, we see actually almost a Gothic ceiling in a Gothic cathedral, but modernized. A modern version of uh, the, the gentle or the graceful structuralism of the Gothic cathedral. Yet his architecture is not expressionistic in the way, for example, we can talk about an uh, expressionist technique and a technical expressionism in Calatrava's work. 
He is not. Uh, there is maybe a certain um, reticence or sense of measure uh, that uh, Minoru Yamasaki had, which uh, arrested him in, in uh, developing extravagantly what might be called, uh, uh, you know, uh, a longing for uh, excessive expression. Uh, Islam also is not very far away. I mean, let, let's look here, you know, and discreetly insinuate it into, in, 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 into the building. The, the truth is behind these formalisms, as, they, as, as, as uh, his work was described to it, there are here sub, subtle things, not uh, screamed, not, uh, uh, you know, obstinate, but uh, uh, they are easily uh, uh, decipherable, decipherable if we are willing to spend some time with his work. Now, the Northwestern National Life Building, here again, we see, um, you know, the emancipation of the column towards something that, uh, in very general terms, would, could be described as ornamental. Of course, there is also static sense or structural sense, but the form itself shows uh, uh, what is called uh, formalism, which is very, very close to what we call ornament or ornamental or even decorative. There is elegance, it's true, there is elegance in, in, in this building, but let's look back to its function. National Life Building. This must be some kind of an insurance company. And here I, I, I feel tempted to ask, are we to glorify uh, an insurance company, company in this way? I mean, in the case of a Gothic cathedral, it was understood it was, it was the house of God. But this is not the house of God. This is the house of an insurance company. And uh, although, you know, yes, they might uh, be godlike, but they are not God. And um, I have some um, uneasiness, so to speak, in, uh, in, uh, in not asking certain questions when I see such a build, you know, glorious as it is. I mean, after all, what are we glorifying here, actually? Making money, this is what we are glorifying. So the Gothic model, is it truly really appropriate? I'm not so sure. Yes, some I think it is splendid. But when you think of, of, of the mechanism that generated it, you wonder, you know, what is the, the, the actual basis for this splendor? Uh, you could say, let's not ask ethical questions. Yes, we can choose that, but I'm not sure is the, the correct attitude. I mean, this, this easily could have been a palace, no? A palace for some, uh, the brilliance of a king or a queen or some kind of, a, you know, worldly power with some celestial uh, touches. This could have been the palace of a present or future Louis Le Soleil, another sun king. But this is not the case here. It's the case of a rather banal, although probably very rich, insurance company. Anyway, uh, what I'm trying to say is, could we look at a building exclusively in aesthetical terms? I don't truly think it, 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 it can be so. You know, it, or it should be so. And yes, there is a globalism here. And when I said non-critical, it's because yes, it doesn't assume a critical dimension. The kind, for example, uh, Goya, the great uh, Spanish uh, painter, assumed when he painted himself with a royal family, you know, a little bit aside in the painting and uh, uh, you know, a little bit in the darkness, and then the faces, the facial expressions of the royal family were rather uh, not, um, you know, emanating uh, 
you know, solar beauty or anything like this. So it, there was a, a, an, a, an indirect uh, criticism uh, in, in, in the painting by Goya. Yes, he assumed the, 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 the subject, he assumed uh, the painting the royal family, but the man in the shadow or a little bit aside, uh, through his posture and through the way he painted the royal family, he was not quite flattering. This I don't see in this architecture. Perhaps for architect, for an architect, it's more difficult to do so. How could you express your, express your resistance towards, let's say, let's say, an institution or a client in whom you don't actually believe a lot? Uh, maybe Louis Kahn was right. In case of a war, an architect has to make, still has to make the wheels of the war machine square, uh, round, as opposed to a painter who, in opposition to war, would paint those wheels square. So it would make the war machine not functioning. But in my opinion, in the case of a war, and maybe I express a naive and idealistic uh, form of thinking, in the case of a world, the architect should also make the wheels of the war machine square. And returning to Minoru Yamasaki, I feel tempted to say that if he had a resistance towards, um, let's say, high capitalism or certain institutions, um, voracious as they are and greedy, uh, maybe he could have expressed this in his architecture, but I don't see any attempt in this direction. Maybe again for the architect is more difficult than, than for a painter. And maybe to an extent, again, Louis Kahn was right. The Pacific Science Center in Seattle from 1962, so mid 20th century. Here we see also, it's, it's, it's kind of interesting. It's, a, it's, an, it's an architecture. So what is the function? Pacific Science, science Center. It's a science center, but look what he, he built in front of the science center. First, in front of the science center, there is the, 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 the explicitly ornamented facade. It is an opaque facade, but because of the ornamentation, it becomes animated. But what to make of these structures, which are just skeletons, is the carcass. They are the carcasses of, of uh, you know, kind of a ghostly, uh, ghostly architecture. But it, it, it is an architecture that mimics some kind of a, you know, Gothic, uh, Gothic structure. And uh, you kind of wonder, you know, it's a science center. This is not a, you know, theological uh, school or center. It's a science center. So why the reference to, you know, to the transcendentalism of the, of the, of the cathedrals? You wonder. I'm also surprised that they were built, that the clients, you know, uh, accepted this proposal. Uh, it's hard for me to believe that the clients uh, required in the program something like this. It's possible that uh, this is an interpretation of the program by the architect. This Japanese American architect called Minoru Yamasaki. Now, this ornamentation attempts to bring some gentleness to what otherwise would have been a rather, you know, even boring or brutal, uh, you know, uh, boxy architecture. Thanks to the, to the, the ornamental, uh, I don't know, quasi-structural, uh, it becomes um, more gentle. There is a certain gracefulness here, thanks to the ornament. And in, in many senses and in many ways, this is what exactly what the ornament does. It brings some grace when it is done properly and not just with a, an applied, uh, imported uh, decoration, uh, no, applied to the walls. Now, if somehow that ornamentation is connected or connectable to the structure, then uh, it, it could indeed uh, soften the image of the buildings. I, am, I recall now what uh, Boileau said 
when he talked about l'esprit de geometry and l'esprit de finesse. And he said that a good work should have both the spirit of geometry and the spirit of fineness. And what is the spirit of geometry? Essentially structure. And what is the spirit of fineness is, is essentially ornament. So if you can bring together, or speaking in very general terms, to bring together the masculine principle, that is structure, uh, together with the feminine principle, that is ornament. And this, this is what it seems Minoru Yamasaki did in this work as, work, this work as well. Not, I, I don't know enough about this building to know what exactly he meant by the symbolism of this, uh, you know, rather massive, I mean, not so much, not massive, but, uh, you know, impressive through, because of their size. These, uh, these structures are not, uh, you can tell, you know, from the parapet here and, uh, you know, a human being is uh, quite small compared to these things. What do they mean? Maybe, you know, it's the, 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 uh, some kind of a vision of a possible future towards which, with the help of science, we are moving, you know, uh, some kind of an Edenic, uh, you know, future, some kind of a paradise where man and God are married through the intervention of science. I don't know. I just... Uh, you know, improvise some some uh, possible interpretation. Now, look how, look at how how the construction took place with these prefabricated uh, large pieces. Uh, it was obviously an expensive uh, enterprise and an expensive uh, building or an expensive buildings because there are several. But all in all, I think we can appreciate the effort of a modern architect to soften modernism through uh, what some might call formalism and others might call ornamentalism. I mean, it's enough to compare this building in the left corner, in the bottom left corner, with what uh, Minoru Yamasaki did to see that I mean, this is was, was also modern and it's possible it was built not much earlier than this. But this is a different attitude altogether. Why? Because it welcomed ornament. While this one didn't completely. Also to, to soften the image of science, to make it more graceful, was perhaps a, a positive thing. And perhaps it was encouraged by the very, you know, institutions that, uh, in, that uh, made this uh, project uh, come, come to life. Now, another, you know, corporate building, Horace Mann um, Educators Corporation in Springfield, Illinois from 1972. This kind of officious, officious, if I am to use a word, house existence, I, I, uh, I'm not convinced of, um, because I think there is a difference between official and officious. This one I would describe as uh, officious. You know, it's, it's, it's clearly about authority. It's clearly about uh, order and uh, rhythm. And, you know, it's, it's, it's giving you the illusion that uh, things here can only be right and righteous, maybe more than right, righteous. And the flag itself is already setting the tone. It's, it's, it's a building that uh, yet serves the, 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 the uh, you know, the establishment. Uh, and he was very good at this, very accommodating as he served the establishment uh, in a, in a, obvious way with his uh, World Trade Center. It's not a bad building, but uh, 
I don't know. I mean, it's 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 a building which doesn't really take us by surprise. It's I'm not saying that all buildings should take us by surprise. But my personal preferences are more towards the towards the rebels. And uh, Yamasaki was not. Uh, I, I wouldn't describe him as a rebel, but in the field of architecture, somehow because he assumed the ornament. There seems to be the, the insinuation of some kind of a graceful or gentle uh, rebellion. Another religious building in uh, Bloomfield Township in Michigan from 1973, Temple Beth El, and temple like is. Um, I don't know. I mean, you know this 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 meeting between, uh, between I, I, it's something that makes me a little bit uncomfortable. This monolithical, you know, certitude. This this building, which is which is so gloriously advocating and expressing a certitude. You know, the certitude of a certain face. There is no doubting here at all. I mean. I mean, yes, you could uh, fantasize that uh, you know the curvature here as opposed to what's going at the top, uh, the different curvatures would um, somehow express some kind of indirect uh, reticence or doubting. Um, I, I, I don't know. Um, all in all, he seems to believe, I mean, he's, it seems he believed in, 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 uh, in uh, he didn't believe in protest in protesting anything. He believed in uh, serving, uh, as I said, uh, establishment, uh, whatever the, the, the client was doing, uh, corporate, uh, an insurance company or a religious company, if I can call them so, because uh, the church itself became some kind of a business in the modern world and in the United States as well. Uh, I, actually, I don't think there is such a big distance between uh, you know, a uh, financial uh, corporation and the religious corporation. They are both corporations and both very interested in money. Anyway, and not just the, in the United States. But on the other hand, if we look at the building now from here and we see clearly here um, uh, an ornamental gentleness that make you think of other times and other worlds and other cultures and uh, even other religions uh, it's kind of interesting you know and uh, uh, yes this curvature this curved service also seems to suggest a uh, gentleness which perhaps uh, at the core of the institution uh, itself didn't quite exist and uh, you know the less than gentle uh, entrance into the building, uh, you know, expresses the righteousness of uh, uh, you know rigor and uh, and so on. This replaces, in a way, the colonnade of classical orders, but it communicates kind of the same thing. When you are in front of these doors, you, you the doors tell you, uh, you know, uh, behave and you will be protected, you will be safe, and everything will be fine because there is order in the world. And we know very well there isn't. In fact, Minoru Yamasaki should have known himself very well because uh, North American bombers bombed uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki, uh, killing a few hundred thousand people and provoking immense, immense suffering. Not that the Japanese didn't provoke suffering themselves, but uh, anyway, maybe we shouldn't get into these uh, fields. Maybe we should just look at the splendor of architecture and the splendor of this photograph where everything seems, seems to be right and fine. And it is in a way a good building, but uh, uh, Century Plaza Towers, Los Angeles, 1975. I think they are quite elegant, you know, because of the, the fenestration, which is done uh, appropriately. And also, as opposed to most, most office towers, here we are dealing with vertical windows, not the paradigmatic, dogmatic for modernism uh, 
continuous uh, horizontal uh, uh, window, but vertical and uh, narrow. And this is uh, almost uh, paroxystically uh, applied at the World Trade Center, which we are going to see a little later. I would say these towers are good uh, in, in their own uh, you know, way of doing architecture. They are elegant. They are, they are you know, obviously rational, but they are gently rational. I, I, I actually admire, and I'm, I'm beginning to admire Minoru Yamasaki for the fact that he's able, in, at least in some of his buildings and quite large buildings, to still remain somehow gentle. You know, uh, and it has to do essentially with, with proportions, with, uh, and with the way he, he, he handles the, the windows. We remember that Frank Lloyd Wright said, you know, architecture is, uh, is uh, uh, well, there wouldn't be any problem with architecture if there were no, if we, if we wouldn't have to, to, to make windows or to place windows in a, in, 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 in a building. He didn't use quite these words, but he meant that, uh, you know, the window was the trouble, the problem. How, how do you, how do you pierce that wall? How do you make it? And uh, it seems uh, Minoru Yamasaki, uh, Yamasaki found a way to, to employ the window. You see the window almost disappears somehow, you know, it becomes a, a tapestry, which it happens that was built essentially with glass, but it's woven somehow. This aspect of his architecture, the woven part of his architecture, uh, which is not always present, uh, is perhaps an interesting uh, uh, thing to contemplate. I mean, this country, the United States, has many skyscrapers, many tall buildings, but not all have the, the same gracefulness uh, that, that at least these two buildings by uh, Yamasaki do have. Did he also design these buildings? It's possible, but I do not know. Uh, but it's possible he also designed these. It's also possible he might not have, I don't know. But it, looking uh, back at the works we already saw, it is possible he designed these as well. And again, it's kind of interesting that tomorrow we'll talk about Wallace Harrison and we'll see his civic center in Albany, New York, which also employs an architecture and built around the same time. Um, it would be interesting actually to, to, to see the works of Wallace Harrison and compare them with the works of Minoru Yamasaki. BOK Tower in Tulsa, 1975. Uh, this one again is, uh, I would say, uh, I, felt, I felt tempted to say almost acceptable. I think it would have been better if he didn't have this thing at the top. It would, if it would have been from bottom to top, I know that the base is important and shouldn't be identical with the top, but um, something here that uh, bothers me. Um, anyway, otherwise the, the, the whole body of, of, of the skyscraper is, uh, is, is good uh, and is also, again, because it doesn't have that paradigmatic fenestration and the, you, almost, uh, you almost don't see the windows or you don't think of, 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 of having their windows. And of course it has. Yeah, I mean, here, you know, where are the windows? Of course it has windows, but Somehow he he transcended the the he was able to 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 uh, dilute in a way the, the the you know the the parameters of a window as such he transformed the the, the sumum of windows into some kind of a rug if I am to use maybe a strange word 
Because yes, if, if I look at this picture, like a painter looks at the painting, meaning almost closing his eyes, I, I don't actually see, especially if I look from, from the side, I don't actually see the windows. And yet it has windows. I'm not talking about the base where the windows are quite obvious. And I actually think that the problem with him is here at the base and at the top, maybe a little less at the World Trade Center, but we'll arrive there. I think the, the base is rather conveniently, you know, comfortable. I mean, if I am to judge an architect, his character or her character uh, based on the, on the, on the, on the base of the building and the top of the building, I would say that in this case, Minoru Yamasaki showed uh, his, um, in my opinion, uh, his officious O-F-I-C-O-U-S. And I'm not sure this, this word exists. And if it doesn't exist, I apologize. His officious uh, serving of functions for, uh, you know, uh, unquestioned, uh, unquestioned uh, authorities or, uh, you know, clients or corporations, you name them, for the establishment. It would be also very attractive to compare, for example, what he did in this corner and his handling of the arches with what, you know, uh, Louis Kahn did uh, in Dhaka. Um, Louis Kahn was an Ur architect, a fundamentalist, and uh, uh, his architecture is archetypal, is uh, archaic. Here we are dealing with a, a high level of being so-called official, smoothly official, and uh, not uh, intending in any way to irritate. This is probably uh, one of the explanations why he, he, rece he received such commissions. He received them because he was not irritating anybody. <laughs> and uh, um, that's, not, uh, that's not an easy thing to do when you are dealing with uh, giants in the field of, uh, you know, you can imagine who built this building. Now the, Tower in Seattle, 1977, Rainier Tower uh, in Seattle. This one is a little bit more extravagant because again, his base, but here he was adventurous. In my opinion, too adventurous because this is what happens when one is uh, abstaining from being extravagant and at one moment has the chance to become extravagant. There is a good chance that he becomes too extravagant. And you'll understand what I'm talking about when we'll see other pictures with this building. Look at this. <laughs> you know, it's, um, again, I think he's showing he, he had some troubles with the base of the building and the top. But in this case, the base is alarmingly uh, resembling uh, an emphatic rhetorical pedestal. And uh, it's, it's in this case, we can talk about architecture as an object. It is an object. Uh, and uh, that's exactly what uh, Wang Shu, the Chinese, uh, the first Chinese Pritzker Prize winner was against. And I, I am on the side of Wang Shu. A building should not be an object and is not an object. But I'm afraid that in this case, um, Minoru Yamasaki treated this building rather as an object. It's okay to make such an object to place it on a table, but to make it and to make it in this way and, and, and place it in a city uh, is another thing. Yes, it, it is in a way striking, uh, and you can think about the you know the structural uh, you know uh, acrobatics involved. But you also have to think about the, the, the op opaqueness offered to the street. When usually exactly at the level of the street, you open up your building. Yes, he, there is something here, the base, but uh, essentially the, the, the monumental base of the building is uh, rather misanthropic. 
plus this triumphalist architecture, because I, I, I feel justified to call it so. It's a triumphalist architecture. What is the name of this triumph, actually? What are we celebrating here? Bureaucracy, uh, financial speculations. What is so, uh, you know, uh, celebratory here? What is the reason for, the, for this uh, monumental uh, uh, tour de force? Now, Federal Reserve Bank in Richmond, 1978. This picture is very good for what I was trying to say before. Here we have the, you know, the, the paradigmatic, uh, dogmatic, horizontal, uh, continuous window for office towers. And here we have what he does. And I think what he does is better, it's more subtle, is graphically and architecturally more convincing because he almost makes the window disappear. Uh, and the very idea to create thin or narrow vertical windows is almost anti-modern. And, uh, but he's able to create these facades which remind me of the paintings of Daniel Burin. Uh, French, uh, maybe he still lives, uh, French uh, influential painter who only painted um, stripes, vertical stripes, 8.7 centimeters wide in two colors all his life. That's all he did. And he arrived to with that even, uh, you know, on, uh, well, he changed a little bit on the Fondation Louis Vuitton, but he did it for other buildings in Paris and so on and uh, installations. Daniel Burin. Now, I think, again, this picture, I think, should be contemplated and uh, uh, discussed because it's interesting that two modern buildings, both for office towers, adopted very different strategies. Uh, besides the fact that both are, you know, tall, uh, tall buildings. And there is more elegance in this one, I would say then in this one, and then in this one, and then in this one. Yes, I mean, Noru Yamasaki was, I would say, more skillful. 100 Washington Square, Minneapolis, 1982. This, this kind of uh, predictable uh, modernity in an office uh, building, uh, I, um, I accept. Maybe I don't applaud enthusiastically. I do not, uh, you know, feel I am achieving. I'm uh, approaching nirvana. But again, I think the windows make uh, Minoru Yamasaki special, and in this case too, although they are different from the building that we just saw. Torre Picasso, Madrid, 1988. I wonder what Picasso might have thought of it. Um, I don't know very well what to say about it besides what I already said about the other towers, except that this is in Madrid. Uh, Philip Johnson was more adventurous because he made the towers uh, inclined, but uh, this one is, uh, vertical as anything that is vertical. Why it is called Picasso, I don't know. To me, it has nothing in common with Picasso, but uh, maybe that's not the point. Um, I don't even know what its function is. Torre Picasso, 1988. 
I'm glad he didn't use uh, classical columns and all the rest, uh, considering that 1988 was still, uh, still belonged to what we call postmodernism, uh, although postmodernism was beginning to uh, weaken uh, by the time the construction was knocking at the door, but not at the door of Minoru Yamasaki, as we can see. Again, I think he had troubles with the base of his buildings because uh, I, uh, the purity of the main part of the building, if I can call it so, was easy to do for him. He discovered an architectural language which worked well for, for, uh, for his kind of architecture. The problem was at the base. What to do here? <laughs> you know? So there is some historicism at the base which bothers me a little bit. Sometimes also a little bit at the top. Uh, I think if I am to conceptualize maybe a little bit superficially or simplistically, I would say that he had troubles to bring his, his building back to earth and to bring his building upwards towards the above. In other words, I think he was good at that intermediate segment uh, in the absence of a close proximity to what the earth means and what the sky means. I guess what I want to say is referring to what um, uh, Volprick said that there are architects who are very comfortable working uh, kind of like uh, basement, uh, basement architects. Then there are architects who are good with the middle part of the building, uh, talking vertically, and then there are people who are uh, roof architects and he included himself in that category as a roof architect and also included Zaha Hadid. Uh, I think uh, the, the basement architects, he included Ra Raymond Abraham and uh, I forgot who else. And uh, middle, for the middle portion, he included uh, Stephen Hall and maybe someone else. But it's an interesting idea, you know, to ask yourself, Am I a basement architect? Am I, am I a middle part or intermediate uh, architect? I don't know what word uh, Volprix used. Or am I a roof architect? I think Minoru Yamasaki was good about the middle part, which was the, the preeminent, the biggest, the largest part of the building. But I think the top, and the bottom are rather banal. And not as elegant as the rest of the building, I, I, I would feel. He didn't know how to end his buildings at, the, at both ends, in my opinion. And I'm not saying that it would have been easy to find a solution. Because when you have this purity that made me think of the, you know, the minimalism of uh, Daniel Burin, what do you do at the top? How do you end this? Perhaps it's better to continue all the way, but he wanted to cap it and to, to stop it. And um, it's difficult, both at the bottom and at the top is difficult. As long as you don't see the bottom and the top, I think the building is just fine. Lots of elevators, as you can see. 18, in fact, if I counted well. Anyway.
the Twin Towers. Now we arrive finally at the Twin Towers in New York City. We all know them. They do not exist any longer. Um, yeah, there are many towers around them. There were and there are and there will be. They were replaced by one single tower. But now looking back, Although I was critical of these two towers when I found myself in their proximity, I'm a little bit less confident in my criticism. As you can see here, where are the windows? I mean, again, I think he did a, you know, a special job here by, by, uh, uh, by uh, miniaturizing windows, although they are not small, but because of the scale and the fact that he was preoccupied by this uh, uh, verticality, this, this succession of, of vertical lines, one after the other, one near the other, the windows almost disappear. So this is halfway between a wall, an opaque wall, and a transparent wall, but it's neither. And I think he did a good job in, in, in this sense. And yes, he was confronted with the same problem of the base, and I think he solved it rather gracefully, considering the giant uh, task here, uh, considering the, the immensity of the project and of the buildings. Again, I think he is and was at his best when he was able to negotiate between structure and ornament. And um, this is also done uh, more recently in the in, the, in a tower built by shop uh, in, in Manhattan, uh, <clears throat> where ornament is welcomed in a very, in a different way, kind of from what we see here, but uh, still uh, some similarities uh, might, might be contemplated, particularly if we look at this uh, you know, so-called detail. Uh, it's it's uh, it's an interesting architecture when we think that uh, you know this we are dealing with uh, you know uh, the, the second half of the 20th century where modernism won the battle with everything else. I did myself a project for this area for the memorial garden for more than 3000 uh, victims of the terrible tragedy. I don't know if I have that, uh, that project here, which I, I did to an almost complete extent, but I didn't send it to, um, to New York to be evaluated. Anyway, uh, there is a lot to be said, of course, just just about these buildings because of 9-11. Um, I wonder what uh, Minoru Yamasaki might have said, and he could have been alive when the tragedy happened. But, I think no one would contest that these buildings represented hegemony, and it was the financial hegemony. hegemony. It, 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 these buildings were built for what was called World Trade Center, not local trade center, but World Trade Center. These two towers, uh, of course, irritated other people, other countries. They represented, uh, you know, uh, very powerful and obvious, uh, you know, uh, financial um, hegemony. They became symbols of uh, North American supremacy. Now, are financial transactions and financial speculations 
graceful activities? I am not sure about that. Uh, Minoru Yamasaki attempted to create a graceful architecture, you know, uh, still handling the office tower problem, how to do it. And I think he did it uh, approximately well. Um, and I think the main, uh, the main uh, uh, positive uh, aspect of this work is the fact that there were two towers and not just one. I don't know if this, this was the program or he, he thought of it two in towers, you know, and, you know, even twinness itself should make us think, what does it mean, you know, to, to have a twin, a twin sister or a twin brother, like Tadawando, Tadawando has a twin brother. What does it mean to have a, a, a twin in your life? to know that there is someone uh, almost identical like uh, with you. This building through its function proclaimed, you know, authority, uh, power, but because he doubled it, you know, is the, the two-ness to use a, an exa a linguistic exasperation of uh, Peter Eisenman, two nests, T-W-O-N-E-S-S. -S. He actually subverted that power. Yeah. Um, now, it's very possible that those who commissioned this work were very happy with Minoru Yamasaki because he presented to the world, you know, uh, in a attempted a graceful way, something that essentially was not so graceful, actually. You know, this uh, dominance actually in, in, in financial terms of the whole world. Look at them, you know. I mean, <laughs> there was no doubt that these towers, uh, you know, would, uh, would, uh, would show clearly who was, uh, who was uh, you know, uh, controlling the game, so to speak. Uh, all the other towers were, you know, uh, approximations of what these two towers powerfully represented. But because there were two, uh, the ve the, their very uh, doubleness, uh, maybe paradoxically, uh, reduced uh, the, the obstinacy of the, um, you know, power game or, uh, you know, uh, strength. So let's look now because I thought it would be perhaps appropriate to show a few proposals for World Trade Center that were not built. We know the building that was built by David Charles from uh, SOM, Skidmore, Owings and Merrill. But let's remember a few proposals which were not built. You know, there were all kinds of proposals. Uh, this is one of them, which is uh, kind of interestingly, now I'm thinking of it, um, you know, echoing his own work for that, you remember that scientific center or center for science, where there were those uh, carcasses, just structures, you know, and, and here we, we have the same thing, you know, we have the, you know, the structural ghosts of the former uh, towers. I don't know who proposed this uh, project, unfortunately. Now, of course, uh, we also have the, the rhetorics of uh, those, uh, you know, uh, beams of light, which are, you know, unstoppable, unstoppable in the uh, glorious ascension. Um, again, rather, you know, questionable if, if we are to reflect on, 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 on the function of the former buildings. This is the proposal, this one by Daniel Lipskin, who became then in charge of the site plan and so on. He won this competition, but it was not built like he proposed it. He himself, in my opinion, was not very pure because he very conveniently, you know, uh, measured the height of the building and uh, 
um, you know, created a parallel between, uh, you know, the, the year when uh, the United States became uh, independent and, uh, you know, the, the height of the tower. I, I call this professional uh, opportunism, but I guess in order to win such commissions, you need to be a little bit, at least a little bit, uh, an opportunist. Um, these other buildings, these buildings exist. Here we see the proposal by Peter Eisenman, which of course was not built. Um, interestingly, he also had two buildings, but uh, not, uh, not, not. We, we wouldn't really call them uh, twins. But. If we look again at this picture with our eyes almost closed, like a painter does in order to evaluate his uh, painting, uh, what do we see here? We see all these buildings truly made for uh, financial speculations. You know, for uh, they, they, they are, they are, and, and this is just a fragment of what Manhattan is about. I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's, um, it's almost, for me, it's a little bit almost frightening, you know, thinking about what, what kind of work is being done there. Trade. Trade. This is what we are talking about. Trading, meaning uh, transactions, financial transactions, moving money from one place to another with a profit, of course. Because as we know, in capitalism, not to make a profit is sinful. So again, Peter Eisenman, and now let's see, I don't know who did this. Uh, this, um, you know, rather extravagant architecture, but there were many extravagant, uh, extravagant uh, proposals to replace the two towers, the twins that um, that Minoru Yamasaki built. Of course, Sir Norman Foster couldn't miss the point; he had to be there. But this is not, of course, by uh, Sir uh, Norman Foster. Uh, I forgot who, 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 who made this. Um, <laughs> well, I could specu speculate in describing them, you know, this tentacular architecture, monstrous in a way, you know, showing uh, in a certain way the implicitly or explicitly or both the tentacular uh, monstrosity that uh, trading, trading and trading again could actually mean. It's possible that this is by Sir Norman Foster, if I'm not mistaken. Not a very sustainable architecture, whatever he might say. Lots of glass, of course. And no opening window. That is a lot of air conditioning and a lot of artificial energy needed. And we know what that means. Well, here we have, we have the tower as it was built by SOM and David Childs. Then we had, of course, Bjarke Ingers couldn't miss the occasion, but it was not built. You know, he made this proposal and I'm very happy it was not built because I think uh, New York can do better, actually. He did other things that are better than this one. Uh, and uh, what else do we see here? Do we see the tower by Fumihiko Maki, which is also very elegant, but I don't see it here. Um, anyway, at the base, we see New York City with apartment buildings and the, you know, the life has lived as lived. And then uh, we see uh, Mount uh, uh, Olympus where the gods live. And uh, these are the gods of, of, uh, of selling and buying, of, of 
you know, uh, trading, transactions, you know, money, 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 and money again. The society that believes that time is money, uh, in my opinion, very wrongly. And now I will end this presentation. When I lived in Chicago, I had a small, uh, let's call it art architecture gallery. And uh, on some occasion, I showed a, a project done by a Romanian uh, who, uh, architect who at that time was in Barcelona working on his doctorate, uh, doctoral work. And, and he is now an assistant, uh, I think, uh, at uh, the University of Architecture in Bucharest. Uh, I'm talking about uh, Justine Baronja, and he had an interesting um, uh, idea. And actually, I, I, I don't have now here this text. I displayed it in the windows of my gallery. He had the idea inspired by, um, uh, by uh, the Kiss by Brunkush to, to create two towers that embrace each other. And I wrote a text at that time uh, called, um, uh, well, I, 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 I changed the name WTC um, into uh, WEC instead of World Trade Center, World Embrace Center. And because this is what, uh, what he proposed made me think of. And maybe if we would have in the world more understanding, more, uh, and I understand, I, I, I'm aware that I express an idealistic uh, thought and position, but it's possible that if the black and the white would just embrace each other, would, that, would just understand each other, uh, you know, thinking of the title of the book by, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, what's his name, um, who wrote uh, I and Zoo, um, I forgot his name, Martin B B Buber. He, he wrote about I and Zhu. Well, I and Zhu are the twin towers. You know, uh, 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 the two towers that if they would understand each other and if they would proclaim uh, or uh, advocate, uh, um, you know, embracing, uh, maybe, maybe in such a case, the um, you know, uh, a tragedy like it happened would not have happened. Um, I don't know. Uh, in the field of politics, uh, artists are usually um, uh, naive, and I'm sure I, I was and am myself naive. But I like this work by uh, Justine Baroncha. And, and the idea to you know, fight against the calamity, calamity of aggression and war, uh, uh, you know, and uh, essentially death with uh, empathy and understanding and uh, doing exactly what he suggested with these two towers, inspired as they were by um, the well-known uh, sculpture by uh, Constantin Brancusi, which we see here on the, also on, on, the, on the window of, of my gallery. Here is Brunkush, and here is um, Justin Baroncha. And here was the text, which if anyone wants, I could uh, send it uh, to him or her. I have it, but I don't have it here prepared to, uh, to read it. Thank you. And happy birthday, Minoru Yamasaki. <laughs>